It is Saturday night. Thank you for choosing NTV Weekend Edition at 9 o'clock. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi, stepping in for Olive Burrows. Plenty lined up for you as usual. These are among our top stories. Tonight, President Uhuru Kenyatta should personally pay for the illegal reggae train and parliament should be dissolved. Tough demands presented in court in the fight against the Building Bridges Initiative. Plus, that car wash or Boda Boda washing bay may be one of the reasons our environment is suffering. Cleaning these uh, sources, both soil and uh, water, off the grease and the oils is a major challenge. We reckon Kenya loses about 2 to 2.5% two of its GDP annually because of climate change. Also tonight, <laughs> the pandemic hit the tourism industry. <laughs> Women traders at the Maasai Mara are feeling it and hopeful for brighter days. Plus, Man, oh man, suffering Embu men. They hoped their wives would be buttering their bread, but they are battering them instead. They say it's worse, more than just physical abuse. This is Weekend Edition with Smriti Vidyarthi. And joining us in sign language interpretation tonight is Flora Atieno. Now another twist has been added into the much anticipated Building Bridges Initiative appeal case with lawyer Morara Omoke filing an application at the Court of Appeal seeking to compel President Uhuru Kenyatta to refund all money spent on the Building Bridges Initiative to the National Treasury. The city attorney, who had the same demand dismissed by the High Court, also wants the Appellate Court to declare the presidency and parliament illegitimate. In a second round of an enhanced legal onslaught against proponents of the Building Bridges Initiative, lawyer Morara Omoke has reignited calls to have President Uhuru Kenyatta be compelled by the courts to personally refund taxpayers' money spent on the entire Building Bridges Initiative. According to Morara's cross-appeal application filed in the appellate court, on Friday 5th, June 2021, the city attorney argues that the head of state illegally allocated and utilized public funds for the promotion of the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020. Morada's appeal also seeks to have parliament dissolved, arguing that the House had no legal or constitutional capacity to debate or approve the amendment bill in view of the advice by former Chief Justice David Maraga to the president to dissolve parliament. However, a similar application made by the city lawyer was dismissed by the five-judge High Court bench that declared the BBI unconstitutional. The new application also comes barely a week after a three-judge bench in the appellate court, led by its president, Daniel Musinga, directed during the case management conference that all appellants serve their memorandum of appeal within the next seven days from Tuesday. Respondents are to file their responses within 14 days, after which appellants will respond within three days. Court of Appeal President Daniel Musinga will constitute a seven-judge bench that will preside over a four-day marathon hearing of the BBI appeal case filed by President Uhuru Kenyatta, ODM leader Raila Odinga, the Attorney General and the IEBC between the 29th of June and the 2nd of July. Seth Olale, NTV. 
Certainly a story that we will be keeping a close eye on. All right, for now, let's take you to our daily coronavirus situation update. And Kisumu County has recorded the highest number of infections with 54 new cases out of the 383 new infections recording, uh, recorded, rather, putting the total number of cases at 172,325. The new cases are out of a sample size of 3,900. 930 taken in the last 24 hours and the day's positivity rate stands at 9.7 percent. Now 24 deaths have been reported. All our late death reports though having occurred in the months of April and May. Meanwhile 33 more people have recovered from the virus. 1,184 people are admitted at various health facilities and we wish them well. To the vaccinations now, and 975,265 people have been vaccinated with their first dose, while 6,622 have received their second dose. Politics now and National Assembly Speaker Justin Muturi has defended his coronation as the Mount Kenya region spokesperson, saying that that train has left the station and is on its way to achieving what it is meant to. Muturi says there is need for leaders in the region to respect each other's views and work as a bloc ahead of the 2022 general elections. Well, a section of elders led by the Kikuyu Council of Elders, patron Kungu Mwigai, have vowed to keep things as they are, that is, having Muturi as the region's spokesman. He has reiterated that plans are moving forward, regardless of what is said or done by the opposers, who he terms as naysayers. Well, this comes at a time when another group of Kikuyu elders, allied to Muranga Governor Mwangi Wa Iria, continue to reject Muturi's coronation. The leaders were speaking during the burial of Faris Rutere, who was the chairman of the National Council of Elders, chairman of Mount Kenya Council of Elders, and the former secretary general of the Ameru Njuri Ncheke Council of Elders. <laughs> Sisi dio yuko na title D ya Mount Kenya lakini mama ni bibi zetu vijana watoto wetu kwa hivyo sisi dio wenye nchi unity within our region unity in our country we need it not just now because there are certain things that are going to happen next year but we need it all the time not to say that anybody is stifled from expressing their views no, but respect for the views of others. If you expect yours to be respected, you must also, in your commission, respect the views of others. Now this weekend, a contingent of police officers in Chogoria Ward in Mara constituency used tear gas to stop a meeting organized by the service party leader, former Agriculture Cabinet Secretary Mwangi Kyunjuri. The meeting had brought together a host of aspirants eyeing various political seats in the next general election. The police lobbed tear gas to disperse the members and the officers also tear gassed journalists who were interviewing Kyun Jury, forcing the former CS and the journalists to run for safety. Kyun Jury, who has condemned the incident, has accused the national government of perpetrating political intolerance. Now it is June the 5th and today marks World Environment Day. Started back in 1972, the day hopes to raise global awareness on environmental matters such as global warming, sustainable development, marine pollution, among other issues. This year's theme focuses on the restoration of the world's ecosystems and Anita Nkonge explains how Kenyans are impacted by land degradation in particular. Save the planet, a message that has been reiterated for years. This year's World Environment Day theme is the restoration of the world's ecosystem. One such example is land degradation. 
caused by multiple forces, including extreme weather conditions, it adversely impacts food production, livelihoods and overall ecosystems. An estimated 12 million Kenyans, or a third of the population, directly affected um, because they live on land that is being degraded. And of course, climate change, the question of our moment, is further accelerating that. We reckon Kenya loses about 2 to 2.5% two of its GDP annually because of climate change. Some of the counties affected by land degradation in Kenya include Samburu, Kitui, Makweni, Kilifi, Baringo, among other counties in the north. In the early 2000s, almost a third of Kenya was affected by severe to very severe land degradation. degradation. And the economic loss just in Kenya was estimated at $1.5 billion per annum, 5% of the GDP. The UN says that solving land degradation matters involves the combined input of both government and ordinary Kenyans. Kenya officially marked World Environment Day at Garissa University, which suffered a terror attack by the Al-Shabaab terror group six years ago. A thousand seedlings were planted and a statement read on behalf of President Uhuru Kenyatta. We planted trees in honor of our heroes and heroes that we lost through cowardly acts of terrorism. And the president said it should be marked here to show the whole world and the cowards. Because that's what they are. In Nairobi, Nema and various stakeholders planted bamboo tree seedlings along Nairobi River in a bid to restore part of the riparian reserve. The Kenya Scouts Association marked the day with a cleanup exercise at the Kibra slum and tree planting, among other activities. The government, through the Ministry of Environment and Forestry and with support from other stakeholders, has adopted a coordinated approach to manage, conserve and expand forests sustainably to attain a minimum of 10% forest cover nationally by 2022. Anita Konge, NTV. Well, the border border sector is the most common mode of transport in many parts of the country, employing thousands of youth. It is also a major source of air and water pollution, thereby putting the environment at risk. What if there would be border borders that didn't use fuel? Wouldn't the environment have healthier lungs? Gabriel Kudaka brings this reality home with his report on this World Environment Day. From urban areas to rural setups, commercially used motorcycles, commonly referred to as the border borders, are sometimes the preferred mode of transport due to their convenience. However, their gas emissions and the manner in which some are cleaned leads to air and water pollution, hence posing a risk to the ecosystem. Kwa ajili ya wanyama wetu. Na isitoshe inamanisha kwamba hii oil ambayo huwa inateremuka kwenye maji inaweza kwa affect samaki zetu. Then they just release these um, oil and greases into the soil. Eventually they are washed and then percolate into the soil and um, the water systems. Cleaning these uh, sources, both soil and uh, water, of the grease and the oils is a major challenge. As this risk carries on, some of those at the heart of it say they are not aware of what they are actually doing to the environment. But some farms are aware of the damage and have been embracing ways of recycling and treating water before releasing it to the rivers. Yanapoondoka kwenye kiwanda uh, kuna safari ambayo ina hatua kadha wa kadha kuhakikisha kwamba maji haya yamerejeshwa kwa hali ambayo yanaweza yakarudi kwenye mto Nzoia na bila kudhuru uh, samaki na wale wengine ambao wanaishi uh, kwenye maji. We will not be able to escape the ravaging effects of the mother nature. You can use one dollar to save the environment. And if you don't use that particular one dollar, you will be able to spend almost $30 to be able to deal with the effects. 
As a way of addressing some of these challenges, some innovators have come up with electric motorbikes that are environmentally friendly. The eco border does not use fuel. Electric motorbike uh, brings a, a lot of savings to the rider in terms of uh, fueling, which now we're going to use batteries which are way cheaper compared to, to, to the fuel, to the petrol. And uh, in terms of servicing, you find that uh, a combustion engine rider needs to, to visit a technician every two weeks or so to change oil, maybe plants. This year's World Environment Day's theme is restoration of ecosystem and Kenyans have been called upon to play their role for a healthier environment. Gabriel Kudaka, NTV. Oh, the eco border is the way to go better for the environment and on your pocket too, it seems. Happy World Environment Day to you all. Certainly hope that you've done something small in your own way for the planet. And if not, there's always tomorrow. All right, shifting focus now. And here's a question for the men. If you were being physically abused by your spouse, would you share this with anyone? Would you even admit to it publicly? Well, many are likely to say a resounding no, while even wondering how a woman can do that to a, quote, real man. Well, in Embu County, some of the men are holding hands through self-help groups as they seek to overcome the challenges they're facing as a result of mistreatment by their wives and even children. This entails physical beatings, emotional abuse, manipulation, as well as exploitation. NTV's Ken Nyaga reports that the men who he spoke with accused the government for their woes and wounds. The man is by African culture the head of the home. The one who calls many of the shots and often seen as the overall authority and the main instiller of discipline. But this is not the case everywhere. Some married men in Kiriari, Embu North, say that they are having it rough as their experiences are even embarrassing. After the beatings, they are hit by stigma. They say that every time they report these incidents to the police, they are dismissed and termed as cowards. Their feeling is that their roles, worth and authority in the family have been knocked off with every incident. The abuse is more than physical. It is emotional and psychological as well. Sasa naulisa, je, dugu sanguni, ni wapi tutakimbiria, mwana umi atakimbiria wapi sasa? Akiwa kasi yake ni kupogongwa. Aki, akienda nyumbani ni vita. Akienda kwa, kwa pale kambia ka police station, ati anaripoti vile amepigwa ni bibi yake na watoto yake, anambiwa kwa ni we mjinga. Sasa huu um, um, mzee atakimbiri wapi? Kwa hivyo ni kusema ya kwamba, huu um, mzee amewashiria na hata sirikari yenyewe. Ndiyo imewashiria hii wasee wawe wakipigwa. Hata hii vita hile kupa inatokana na hii. Hii sirikari ndiyo imepatia watu nguvu na muna hiyo. Wana mume ya kipigwa, ayandi ya karipoti, Hakuna kushikia. Ni tu mtu wanawesha kuangaliwa na muna hiyo waonekane hii musia meseka. Hata kasi ya wesi. Hata kasi hile ingini ya wesi. The frustrations have thrust some men into depression and others into suicide. According to Elijah Ndwega, a resident in Embu, many women are using their husband's resources without consent for their personal gain and when questioned, they result in conflict. Wakati yeye anakopa pesa kule, muse anjui hiyo mambo. Na wakati anakopa ile pesa, wakati wakulipa ukivika, ndipo mwanamume anaona watu wanakuja kusukua ngombe yake. There is comfort in numbers, they say. Some of the men have formed self-help groups to give a platform for them to air and find solutions to some of their challenges. The African culture has presented a key challenge in that men are not ordinarily supposed to show weakness or vulnerability, aiding to many having unresolved issues piling up and getting them into a toxic space. Ken Nyaga, NTV. 
Clearly the pain is real and raw, but certainly glad that those men are holding hands and supporting one another for a better cause. All right, you're watching NTV Weekend Edition. Do stay with us. There's much more on the other side of this short break. Thanks for staying with us. In the heart of the majestic plains of the Maasai Mara, the coronavirus pandemic has wreaked economic havoc. The Maasai community there, which is highly dependent on tourism, has seen its people's livelihoods reduced to almost nothing, with the women being the most affected by it, as they rely on selling traditional Maasai beaded jewellery and souvenirs to tourists. But since COVID-19 hit the country, business has been badly affected. NTV's Rose Wangoi reports that the women are now banking on the annual wildebeest migration, which attracts tourists from all over the world. For more than 20 years, Aunt Simpai has peddled her colorful beaded necklaces and bracelets to safari goers at the entrance gates to Masai Mara National Reserve. The business was so good that she never thought of quitting. However, Simpai's business started dwindling due to the pandemic. Nalo Kitikire, a mother of six children, started selling jewelry 20 years ago. However, in March 2020, life took a nasty turn following an outbreak of COVID-19. Sophia Karasi, a veteran trader, has been in the business for more than a decade. The COVID-19 pandemic has crushed Kenya's billion-dollar tourism industry, leaving tens of hundreds of people struggling to survive. When the first case of coronavirus was announced in Kenya, most lodges in Masai Mara temporarily closed or scaled down business following the cancellation of tourist bookings. Surrounding communities are also feeling the economic effects of COVID-19. The women who gather at the entrance gates largely rely on foreign tourists to remain vibrant. The tourism industry is a vital economic pillar for communities living within Masai Mara, but the pandemic has seen the industry slump to its lowest level in decades. Kuna mama sahi hapa stini group. Yo hapa naka mama salasini pande ile naka ingine salasini. Tunaka tu ara sahi mama moja mlasi manabara mia ama manabara mia mbili. Mimi manabara dola mingi ara kama 20 dola. Hundred <laughs> Mungu tundi onalinda sisi. Na vya mungu shukura ni kwa sababu emelinda sisi. Sisi hapana hakuna mkonjwa. The Narok County government lost 2.25 billion shillings revenue at the Masai Mara Game Reserve when the country was closed to contain the COVID-19 spread in 2020. The loss was occasioned by international travel advisory issued by many countries in the world that banned foreign travel. 
To help try and plug the gaping revenue hole, hoteliers and tour agents have been encouraging domestic tourism. When the sector was slowly recovering from the losses made last year, but unfortunately, the third wave of COVID-19 once again hit the tourist industry. <laughs> the Easter season is one of the peak seasons at the Masai Mara, as many foreigners and locals prefer celebrating the long holiday at the Mara. But a week before Easter, President Uhuru Kenyatta imposed a new lockdown to curb the spread of COVID-19. The cessation of movement in five hotspots counties dealt a major blow to the tourism industry once again. The annual Great Migration of Wild Beast is a breathtaking sight that usually draws tourists to Masai Mara National Reserve from around the world. It's considered one of the most treasured experiences for enthusiasts of nature and wildlife. Meanwhile, at least 200 camps and lodges in the reserve are readying themselves for the arrival of foreign and local tourists between June and August. Currently, we are looking at um, some you know, healthy numbers uh, moving into that period. So we are just uh, you know, internally trying to make sure that we are ready and prepared. But these are difficult times for everybody, and for those who depend solely on tourism for their livelihood, are worried that with the continued uncertainty around COVID-19, it could take many months or even years for the sector to fully recover. Rosongwe, NTV. All right, well, the annual migration is due in the next month or so, so uh, let's hope that their fortunes do improve. Time for a quick break on NTV Weekend Edition. Don't go far, the sports segment is coming up next with Ida Waringa. A very good evening to you, hoping your weekend is off to the perfect start. And Jamaica's two-time Olympic champion Shalia Ann Fraser-Price has solidified her rank as the fastest woman in the world on the way to becoming the second fastest woman in history after running 10.63 seconds in Kingston, Jamaica. Now, the 34-year-old who also won gold at Doha 2019, strict clear to win a national trials warm-up event in Kingston. Only American legend Florence Griffith Joyner has ran faster. Griffith Joyner scorched to a world record 10.49 seconds back in 1988 when Shelly Ann was, get this, one year old before retiring less than a year later. Fraser Price's time eclipses the 10.72 seconds run by American Shikari Richardson as the fastest time in the world this year. It's an improvement of 0.07 seconds on her previous person Personal best of 10.70 set back in 2012. Now, this result will increase the anticipation for the event at the Olympics in Tokyo this summer. Fraser Price will run at the Jamaican Championships later in June before setting her sights on the Tokyo 100 meters final on 31st July. Natasha Morrison is right here with her. Shelly and Fraser Price steps away. Look at the world champion step away. Shelly and Fraser Price comes across the line. What a performance. And just quickly, for those of you who will remember, NTV Sport did get an exclusive with Shelly Ann Fraser-Price back in 2020. She let us know about her plans for Tokyo Olympics, and they definitely do look like they are very much on a course. Now, let's bring it back home, but still on athletics, and it's ready, set, go for the third edition of the Eldorit City Marathon on Sunday after many interruptions owing to effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's Africa's highest paying marathon with 3.5 million shillings. That's well over 30,000 US dollars each for the winner of the men and women's 42 kilometer race. It's a Kenyan uh, race and uh, we don't want the pace setters to assist some few athletes. So every athlete will run on a fair game. And that is what we are saying. We cannot have pace setters on, 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 on the Lore City Marathon. I really hope for the best. I know this is the home of champions, the city of champions, and competition will be very high. I hope for the best because I have been training and I'm prepared for it. 
Great. And Tasca FC, Equity and Bidka United are through to the quarterfinals of the Football Kenya Federation Betway Cup after picking up wins in their round of 16 matches played on Saturday. Now the Brewers beat Luanda Villa 1-0 while Equity edged Vedpro 2-1 and Bidco beat Egerton 1-0. Sunday sees several top light sides in action when Bandari takes on Sigala Gala. Gormahia host Mara Sugar, AFC Leopards play Bungoma Superstars, but Lindsay Stars up against Nairobi City Stars and KCB clash with Kariobangi Sharks. And still on the local scene, over 120 golfers took part in the first leg of this year's edition of the Nation Classic Golf Series that teed off at the nine-hole Eldoret Golf Club in Uasin Gishu County. Eldoret Club golfers, including Elgeo Marquette County Governor Alex Tolgus, were amongst the first team to tee off. A number of golfers from other clubs, including Francisca Gishoro from the Cabeta-based Bet Club and Nation Media's Larry Ngala, also took part. Now, the 2020 event was cancelled due to the pandemic, and this year's edition was postponed by a month also due to effects of the virus. Great, that does it for tonight. Smriti will be back after the break with much more. Do enjoy your viewing. Welcome back. A 53-year-old man allegedly defiled a 14-year-old girl in Kabkres, Nakuru County. Local authorities in the area stand accused of pushing the victim's family towards having the case settled out of court, despite the matter being reported to the police. Bridget Sangana spoke with the family as well as the authorities and now narrates what she found out. Just two years into teenage and her innocence has been taken from her by no stranger. It has been a fortnight of anguish for this family. Their 14-year-old was allegedly defiled by a neighbor. on Monday, the 24th. Nilikuwa imetumwa siku mara mama. Hiyo saa nilienda nikapata mzee anakaranga anakaranga mguu ya ngombe. Nikamuuliza ndapata mboga, kanambia ya mboga iko utapata. She honored his invite, but he dishonored her sanctity. She says the man attacked her after she took the vegetables she had gone to buy from him for supper. Vile alinipatiza vile anataka kwenda kunipatia hivi akanishika mkono wangu wa right then akanilalisha kwa kiti chenye nilikuwa na akafunga mlango akanifunika mdomo ndo akanirep nikatoka nikaenda nyumbani sikutaka kuambia mamu jo aliniambia nikienda kuambia mtu ataniua the threat was enough to keep her silent back home she did not tell her parents of the horrific ordeal immediately mpaka asubuhi nikiamka kukua akakuta akanisa mamu nikito mtu akishika mimba anaonekana hazi ama nasikia hazi. Kamwambia mimba unasikia after 2 weeks utaanza kufikia sana yani ya mimba. Na ugonjwa kamwambia ugonjwa mimi siwezi kuwa. Hiyo mpaka waenda paka hospitali. Ngamuliza kwa nini unaniuliza hivyo? Ndio akakuta kaniambia mama, wewe ni mama yangu na nikikuambia usinichape na papa asinichape. Ngamwambia sawa wewe se, sema. Mtoto akaniambia vile ulimtuma chana mboga once the community got wind of the assault, they went and beat up the accused man. The family then reported the incident at the Kaptembo police station as they sought medical assistance for their daughter. They expected the area chief to help them pursue justice through the legal system. However, he sent the area elders to ask the family to have the matter settled out of court. <laughs> The Nakuru East Deputy County Commissioner, however, says the suspect is out on a 20,000 shilling bond due to the injuries he sustained after the mob attacked him. Hakuna kesi kama hiyo inafanywe inje ya kutini. Hata ifanywe hata kwa police station. Na in fact, any public officer 
ambaye ataingilia kesi kama hiyo kufanya kangaroo court tunafuta yeye kasi immediately According to the Sexual Offences Act of 2006, a person who commits an offence of defilement with a child between the age of 12 and 15 years is liable upon conviction to imprisonment for a term not less than 20 years. But according to civil rights organisations which work with defilement matters, such cases are hardly prosecuted due to community influence. It's a very special case because the parents are willing to speak out, but the local administration, the people that have been entrusted by the government to take care of the community, are the people that are trying to cover these stories. And it's very sad. Wasazi, wachukue jukumu, kwa sababu kuna kipenge ya sheria ya children protection, inaitua neglect. Na tukipata kwamba hata, hata kama we ni musasi na mtoto yako hamefanyua defilement, na tupate pia wewe kuna neglect iko ndani, hata wewe musasi tunakupeleka kutini. Cases of defilement, rape and gender-based violence have been on the rise in the country and it has been a tough balancing act for authorities to prosecute the perpetrators when the pressure comes from the community to settle such incidences out of court. Bridget Ghana, NTV, Nakuru. All right, from that, let's shift focus to some uh, better news. And the Nation Media Group is the only media house in Kenya to win awards at the International News Media Association Awards as it scooped top positions in various coveted categories. Now, from the list of finalists, judges selected the best in six world regions and the best in Africa is Nation Media Group's Nation Leadership Forum. The uh, forum says that the um, NLF created an opportunity for Kenyans to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the nation at large, create a revenue stream during the pandemic, and enhanced NMG's brand in the thought leadership space. A huge win for NMG was in the best use of an event to build a news brand category, where the Nation Leadership Forum was position one globally. Now the Kusi Ideas Festival 2020 was position two in the same category, which is the best use of an event to build a news brand. And uh, INMA says that Kusi enabled pan-Africanists from across the globe to dissect the continent's current situation in relation to COVID-19, as well as raise more revenue for the group. The festival had 230 delegates who attended in person and over 14,000 participants from 44 countries logging into NMG's online platforms. In the best use of print category, the Daily Nation rebrand was positioned too, with a citation that it had increased top of mind awareness among readers and stakeholders, plus was more inclusive to the youth due to the campaign. Position one in that category was New Zealand's Viva magazine, owned by NZME. And in the best product and tech innovation, Nation Dot Africa received what the organizers call an honorable mention. And the sixth award that NMG featured in is the best use of audio category, where Nation Audio received an honorable mention. The platform helped capitalize on the opportunities and innovations available for Africa to tell its own stories in the 21st century in a global context. The 2021 Global Media Awards competition garnered 644 entries from 212 news media brands in 37 countries. What an achievement. Congratulations to the entire group. At this point, we take another break. We'll be back in a moment. A contingent of Kenyan Defence Forces flew back today from Darfur after completing their mission in Sudan, which ended on the 31st of December 2020. This after serving under the African United Nation hybrid operation UN Ahmed for a period of 21 months. UN Ahmed was established in 2007 with the protection of civilians as its core mandate. The company was received by the Deputy Army Commander, Major General Albert Kendagor, at the Embakasi Garrison. The military police company left for Darfur on the 19th of September 2018 and did not engage in combat. Their operation area included investigations, crime and prevention, traffic rules, implementation and VIP protection.
authority that has been bestowed upon us as the military police. And all these jobs we have been doing, we have uh, observed a lot of integrity, a lot of uh, respect for diversity, and observing high levels of professionalism that has seen us serve for all this long. Uh, as we come back home, I can say the UN is happy because of all of the job that you have done. They are so happy because of the job that soldiers have done. All right, well, that story wraps up NTV Weekend Edition. Thanks ever so much for watching. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi, and joining us in sign language interpretation has been Flora Atieno. Do remember to keep safe, mask up, wash your hands, and maintain a social distance. In the meantime, though, stay tuned. Jam Down is coming up next on NTV. Bye-bye.